Yo, what's up, everybody? Welcome back to The Progenitor. This is the show where we go over a director's entire filmography, talk about themes, pacing, give a brief review, talk about our favorite scenes, and all within 15 to 30 minutes. So let's get started. Today, we're talking about one of Ridley Scott's most underrated films, one of my all-time favorites. It is in my top 10 of all Ridley Scott films. This movie is called The Matchstick Men, which is also, actually, there is no the, it's just called Matchstick Men, and it is a con man movie. So for all you guys who love con man movies, this is in the vein, and it's one of Ridley Scott's funniest films. So I really feel like he stretches himself in this particular film in many different areas, I just want to talk about a couple of them. So before we get into that, let's talk a little bit more about production. They had a budget of around $62 million. This is one of his most intimate, small films. There's two characters. There's no epic scale. You're not going across desert landscapes or numerous castles. No, you're staying in L.A. You're staying in California, Southern California, Specifically, you're staying within L.A., North Hollywood, downtown L.A., Anaheim, Culver City, Venice. And uh, one of the funny things is is it's supposed to be shot in LAX, but when you see it, it's not LAX. So the first time I saw their quote-unquote LAX, I knew it was an Anaheim Convention Center because I was just there. It, it definitely does not look like an airport. And it definitely does not look like a bunch of terminals. It looks like a cafeteria, pretty much. So I was very surprised they decided to shoot it there. But hey, it was their choice. So there you go. It's still a great film. A couple things that I really thought really Scott was stre- stretching himself in is number one, he played with the lighting a lot more, trying to get into the mind and the psychology of the characters, especially the one played by Nicolas Cage and just in terms of his phobias and his tics and just everything in regards to whatever disorder he has, which does he have a disorder? You'll find out when you watch the movie. Okay. So we got that. So let's talk a little bit about the cast and crew. You guys know directors Ridley Scott. And it's produced by Ridley Scott, which I really like. You know, he's getting deeper and deeper into producing more and more of his work. And he worked with a couple of guys who worked with Robert Zemeckis, including Steve Starkey, Jack Rapka, and Ted Griffin also helped produce. He was a co-producer on Wolf of Wall Street, which is another great film. And the screenplay was written by Ted and Nicholas Griffin. Ted Griffin, also the producer he helped write oceans 11 which was directed by steven soderbergh and it was based on a book by eric garcia the music was written by the og legend Hans zimmer we have cinematography by john matheson we'll go over that in a little bit production design by tom foden and the film was edited by dodie dorn who i adore she she has edited a number of Chris Nolan films, including Memento, Insomnia, and she's also done a number of Ridley Scott films. We'll get into those. She's worked with David Ayer on End of Watch, Sabotage, Fury, and Zack Snyder's Justice League, which is four hours of epicness. And we'll get into like that whole epic feel uh, regarding Dodie Dorn, but that's later on in a separate film and you have just an all-round all-star cast you got Nicolas Cage the goat he's the greatest of all time if you ask me he can do any genre he can do any character he can do crazy he can do nuanced and this is a bit of both 
you know, he's trying to play a con man. So he's got to con the people that he's uh, to show that he's normal, but he's actually going through a bunch of guilt and ticks and just a bunch of psychological problems that throughout the movie he's going to try to fix. Um, next up, you got Sam Rockwell, great character actor. You have Allison Lohman. She's great. Bruce Altman. Bruce McGill. Now, this guy, he's a fun character actor. He's uh, he's an attorney in The Insider. He's in Ali. He's in Collateral. He's in um, a recent TV show, Jack Reacher. He plays like the, the cop or, or like a commissioner or something. I think he's the mayor, and then he promotes himself to be a police commissioner. And he's corrupt as fuck, but yeah. And you have a cameo by Melora Walters as Nicolas Cage's ex-wife. It's, you know, it's just an all-round great character actor uh, piece. This is a very character-driven piece. There's, like I mentioned before, there's no epicness to it, unless we're just talking about the epic characters. Okay, let's continue. Wife's Corner. My wife really enjoyed this film, but she kind of figured out the twist. Now, spoiler alert, it turns out that the con goes extremely well against Nicolas Cage's character. We'll get into that a little later. And Ridley Scott collabs. So this is John Matheson's third film with Ridley Scott. This is Hans Zimmer's sixth film with Ridley Scott. And you will see Dodie Dorn return in future films. Now, I mentioned this before, but this is uh, technically one of Ridley Scott's more experimental films in terms of lighting, in terms of cinematography, in terms of getting into the character's mindset. So just a little bit about the story of the film. Nicolas Cage plays a con man. Sam Rockwell is his partner, and it turns out Nicolas Cage is suffering from a lot of different psychological problems, and he goes to a shrink to get medicine, and when he's with the shrink, it turns out the shrink, who is recommended by Sam Rockwell's character, um, so, so that Nicolas Cage's character can get, like, a prescription, pretty much. And so basically... What happens is he goes to the psychiatrist. The psychiatrist tries to deep dive into Nicolas Cage's character, finds out that Nicolas Cage has a, had possibly might have had a daughter. Um, and next thing you know, Nicolas Cage meets his daughter, quote unquote, and starts to try to build up a relationship with her. And from there... Things go fun, crazy, and unexpected in a long con that has been orchestrated, quote, uh, spoiler alert, by so Sam Rockwell, because Sam Rockwell knows that his mentor, Nicolas Cage, has a bunch of cash stashed all around town. And he knows that if he can guilt Nicolas Cage's character enough, Nicholas Cage will give the money to the daughter if anything happens. And boom, there you go. That's kind of like the short synopsis of the film. Now, let's talk about some of the themes. You got empowered female characters. Ding, ding, ding. Allison Lohman plays Nicholas Cage's daughter to perfection. And basically, she plays a strong-headed strong-willed young lady who wants to learn from her father how to be a con artist. Uh, lo and behold, Nicolas Cage doesn't know, but his daughter already is a con artist, and his daughter isn't really his daughter. So basically, she's pulling a con with Sam Rockwell, and she does a great job at it, and she's empowered because Nicolas Cage is teaching her even more, and you know she's not a side character. This movie is just as much about her as it is Nicolas Cage's uh, continual growth in mature, maturation. Okay, nature, space is a hostile and uncontrollable environment. Yes, ding, ding, ding. Why? It's because 
any time Nicolas Cage's character sees any kind of dust mite, any kind of dust particle, anything that will set off his OCD and his tics, he is a danger to himself and to his team. And because of that, everything else, he needs everything to be perfect. And that can be a problem if you're talking about a con game, right? So that leads to the third uh, theme. The only way to survive is to adapt. Correct. Because you're tricking people. So if you feel like they're coming on to your trick, you got to adapt. And you got to either pull out or you got to just dive deeper until until you know that you're in control once again. So I really like that aspect of the film. Age does not mean a thing. Ding, ding, ding. Allison Lohman is the youngest character in the film. She pulls a a con on Nick Cage. Not only that, Sam Rockwell is younger than Nick Cage. He sets up the long con that Allison Lohman is a part of. So, yep, there you go. Do not trust rich people. Ding, ding, ding. So Bruce McGill's character is a rich dude. He likes to do illegal things with other people's money. So basically, he's a rich dude who's corrupt, which is a huge thing um, that is an underlying theme throughout all Ridley Scott's films. And that's why you want to con them. You want to con them out of their money so you can feel good about yourself and you can spend their money for them because they're probably not going to do it for all any of the right reasons violence don't solve a thing brains do that's what con men do guys they trick you out of your money folks and they take it so yeah violence does not get bruce mcgill's money back so there we go happy wife happy life ding 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 if Nicolas Cage had made his wife happy at the beginning, they wouldn't have divorced. And they wouldn't have, Nicolas Cage probably would have known that his daughter miscarried, was a miscarriage pretty much. So he would have known that it was a long con all along and he wouldn't have gone through all this heartache. But other than that, make your wives happy, dudes. Next up, distrust of authority. I think this is a big thing with con men anyways. So, yeah, we don't need to dive too much into it because it's not as big of a theme in this film um, because there isn't really an authority figure, but there's just distrust of people, especially when you're in the con game. You know what I mean? So money is coveted. It's always coveted. Um, that's what people are always trying to attain in a lot of Ridley Scott films. They want power, they want money, they want prestige, or they just want to live a good life. And the only way to get there, they believe, is through money. And that's why they're in this film, they're conning a bunch of people with a lot of money. They're going to take it and they're going to use it for whatever purposes they want to. Next up. Battle of the Sexes. Definitely in this film. In this film, Nick Cage's character does not know how to deal with a young woman. Does not know how to raise a daughter. And has to struggle his way through the entire process. And through that process, you learn more about his character. You learn more about how he's closed himself off from emotions. And how he's slowly opening up. And how this daughter that he didn't know he had, which he doesn't have, spoiler alert, is the cure for a lot of his tics, a lot of his guilt. It it can be wiped away uh, through this. And that's why it's sort of of a battle of the sexes because he's got to learn how to adapt to his daughter. His daughter has to learn how to adapt to him. They grow together. But... At the same time, they battle each other to figure out, you know, what are the lines. Next, do not trust robots or androids. There are no robots or androids. This will pop up later. Okay, don't worry. We're going to get back to this theme. And the afterlife slash death throughout this film. um, There are moments when Nick Cage's character thinks he's going to die. 
And because of that, he contemplates his life and the choices he's made throughout his life. And I think that's really, really important um, because it shows that he wants to change. It shows that he's not a static character and that there's something inside of him that knows there's something wrong. And, and throughout the film, he has a psychiatrist, right? And later on, you find out that the psychiatrist was really giving him placebos, like fake medicine, fake prescriptions. And you find out that Nick Cage is just suffering from guilt that he hasn't been able to let go of. So I think that's very important. And this film is really great in terms of character study. If you have never seen it, you got to watch it. Okay. So we're going to change this up a little bit. Um, going forward, I'm not going to do specific shots, but talk, I would rather talk about sequences. But for now, I still have specific shots. So at 8 minutes and 2 seconds, you have an oversaturated lighting on Nicolas Cage's face. Um, and this is pretty much just like, this happens often when he sees like the dust mites or you know, he's going through one of his episodes of his his quote-unquote mental disorder. Um, at 11 minutes, 36 seconds, you have the obligatory, oh my God, I knocked my prescription meds down the sink. I need someone to prescribe me new drugs. And then you just see them drain in, you know, wash down the drain with some water. And then you, throughout the movie, there is this, there's always this close-up of a dog um, with a, it's like a model dog with a screw-off head. So at 10 minutes, 22 seconds, it's the first time Nick Cage unscrews it. And then at 37 minutes, 43 seconds, Angela discovers that it unscrews. And she looks inside and sees what's in it. Money is in it. Now, there's a bunch of other scenes. Um, one of my favorite scenes is 51 minutes and 6 seconds. He's like super upset at his daughter. And he, and he just keeps saying, shame on you. Shame on you. And then at an hour, 24 minutes and 3 seconds, this is one of Nick Cage's like explosions. He's waiting in line at the pharmacy because he needs to get his prescription. And he yells at this one guy who's telling him to get to the back of, of the line. And he just, have you ever pissed blood? You know, he just yells it out. It's hilarious. You know, these are just a couple of the shots that I really enjoyed. And like I said, Ridley Scott does not do this that often. He does not make these intimate stories um, in modern day two, three main characters, um, small scale films. Like if you think about like the two, three character films that he has done, you're, what are we talking about? We're talking about The Duelist, two characters. We're talking about Gladiator. It's got a few characters, right? Um, oh, right. Black Rain someone to watch over me these are a little more intimate in terms of characters but in terms of scope they're larger than life black rain they go to tokyo right somewhere to watch over me it's all over new york and it's just more of an overblown not much of a character based story but a plot based story duelist it's in, you know, it's during the Napoleonic Wars, you know, and it's these two characters, but there's so much more going on because you're talking about the Napoleonic Wars. These films, his films are normally very epic in size. This is one of the only ones that just brings it down. We're in LA, we're in one spot. And. And we're going to do the bare minimum of characters so that the main character can grow based on the actions of the other characters around him. 
that doesn't really happen in somewhere to wa- someone to watch over me where the character is driven by plot rather than the character is learning from his surroundings in someone to, someone to watch over me the character doesn't learn he becomes dumber and dumber in lust in this film nick cage is growing and maturing and realizing his actual problem and i think that's far more intimate and just a better a more mature way um of growth for ridley scott as a filmmaker and like i said cinematography is great in this the editing is is tight this is a tight two-hour film and basically um the shots mirror nick cage's psychological mood oversaturation of lights and and it gets a lot of the dust specks <laughs> so it's just a really fun movie you guys definitely have to go check it out and uh fill me in on what your thoughts are all right guys next up what do we got let me see next up we have actually one of my all-time favorite Ridley Scott films so make sure to pick it up i have it on blu-ray i have it on apple and you got to if you're going to watch this movie you got to get the road out this is called kingdom of heaven go with the director's cut the roadhouse cut where they have the intermissions and the prologues and the epilogue go with that film we'll talk about it next time thanks for tuning in all right bye